radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right. Good evening. Fade to Black. How you doing? How you doing? Today is Tuesday, January 16th, 2024. Let's do this, man. I am so ready for tonight's show. That's right. Danny Sheehan. Daniel. Daniel P. Sheehan is on with us tonight. I call him Danny. Danny Sheehan is with us, and tonight we're going to be, well, we're going to be talking about uh, UFOs, uh, ET, the national security state, the present state of disclosure, everything that is going on in Washington, D.C. when it comes to this subject, and uh, there is one person that finds himself at the center of all of this, fighting for our community and the world, and that is Danny Sheehan. And so I am going to get straight to it. Um, help support the show. You know what to do. Uh, get yourself a Fade to Black t-shirt. The links are below. Two shirts, two ways to get them. Get a Game Changer membership today. Everything is signed. Everything includes shipping. Click on the links. Get yourself a Fade to Black t-shirt. All right, let's get straight to it. Daniel Sheehan, J.D. That's right. He's a graduate of Harvard Law School, former director of the Christic Institute, and is a professor of world politics at the University of California. He is the general counsel and co-director for the Institute for Cooperation in Space. He is also uh, has a long and distinguished history as a public interest counsel and was legal counsel in the Pentagon Papers case, Iran Contra, Three Mile Island, and Karen Silkwood, as well as many other other high-profile cases. His CV, his bio, is 10 pages long. I just read the opening sentence. His links are below for New Paradigm Project. That is below.org and also the Romero Institute. And with that, I'm just going to get straight to it. I'm going to bring him in. I'm going to, he's, he's right there. He's right there. There he is. Danny, good evening, young man. Good evening, Jimmy. How are you doing? How are you? I'm fine. A little, little harried uh, in light of all the activity going on in Washington D.C. right now, but uh, that's what we're that's what we're wanting it to be. Yeah, you know, and I want to get uh, I want to get straight to the meat of the matter tonight uh, with you. Uh, I, I I will make I'm going to make a couple of general comments uh, uh, before we get started. One, I don't know now, Danny, over the years, how many interviews we have done or how many conversations we have had uh both uh in and outside of the ufo community when you and i talk it's not it's not necessarily about ufos all the time but uh we certainly have gotten really close over the years and and built a level of uh, trust uh between the two of us and the audience and the community sees that and i want to thank you uh, for that, uh, as we jump into this, um, and nothing warms my heart more than when I'm walking down a hallway and here comes Danny and your arms are out like this, you know, and that's, 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 that's really, really cool. So thank you for all of that. Um, the second thing I want to mention is, um, I've, I've got a little noise coming and maybe your speakers, um, yeah, uh, you, you might want to turn them down if you can. I, I can hear myself coming back through your. It's my loud, booming voice, Danny. I think that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I got my phone turned off. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, that was pretty funny uh, right before the show, Danny. You and I were. I'm texting. You're on the phone right up to show time. But uh, that's the way the world works. Um, I do want to mention everybody that uh, you and I. You were a guest on my TV show, 
And that episode aired when we did the interview, if, if I've got the dates right, I think we did it like in September of last year, November of last year, talking about what was going to be happening in 2024 and everything that you had mentioned in the interview has come to pass. And that was pretty, pretty amazing to see that happen. And that's where we are right now in, in Washington, D.C. So I want to invite everybody listening, go and watch the episode of Into the Vortex with Danny that uh, was just released and think about what is happening in Washington, D.C. today, as well as this interview that we're about to do now. So are you ready? I am ready. It, it, the um, uh, I, I want to start here. Uh, what is going on? We have two different situations, one in the House and one in the Senate. Um, I want to jump to the Senate first, and then we'll come back to the House, because the House is more public, and we know a little bit more about that. Uh, you, uh, but is the Senate going to have hearings? Well, the it's interesting. The, the, the United States Senate, is the one out of its intelligence committee that sort of initiated the response uh, to the the kind of uh, major citizen uprising that's going on around the country that started uh, not, not just back in 2017 with the New York Times articles, front page articles, revealing that there was a top secret US government program investigating UFOs, despite the official lying of the Defense Department and the CIA and the other intelligence communities uh, uh, denying, and the presidents even, denying that there was any kind of a program going on at all. Uh, but the the real, one of the real uh, stimuli to what happened in Congress was, the, of course, the testimony uh, of Colonel Grush. Uh, Colonel Grush the, came on and testified in July, July 26th, in front of the House uh, Oversight Committee. Uh, and he testified under oath that our United States government is in possession of a an intact extraterrestrial uh, non-human spacecraft uh, and in possession of biological evidence of the non-human uh, intelligence that's behind uh, these UFOs. Uh, and so that, that was a, a huge shock uh, to the world uh, that the not only that he would assert it, uh, but very importantly, that the House Oversight Committee would hold a public hearing knowing that that's what he was going to say. Uh, and the very next day, uh, on the 27th of July of 2023, the United States Senate Intelligence Committee unanimously, uh, 17 to nothing, passed uh, to put onto the floor of the United States Senate a 64-page bill, uh, which was setting up a complete disclosure process. Uh, in fact, it was called the UAP Controlled Disclosure Act, uh, and it, it was proposing a step-by-step -step process pursuant to which the United States government would turn over to the National Archives uh, all of the information uh, that was in the possession of and that had been gained into the possession of over the last uh, 80 years. Uh, all of the information about the UFO phenomenon uh, and whatever the non-human intelligence is that is assumed to be behind this, uh, and that this was intended to be publicly revealed uh, over a seven-year period. And now the important thing is, is that uh, every one of the United States senators, Republican and Democrat alike, uh, inside the Intelligence Committee, all voted uh, to approve this particular law. Uh, and it was proposing setting up an entire independent board of review to review all of that information and to make everything that was 25 years old or older available to the public about this. Now, that would include Roswell. It would include Aztec. It would include all kinds of the information of the, the uh, letters that were going back and forth between President Truman, all the stuff about MJ-12. You know, all that would have, was ordered to be made public, okay? Uh, and that that board was supposed to be responsible for facilitating that. Now, even though that bill had provided for allowing to postpone some of the information, if the president determined that, that it should be postponed, 
it was very specifically stated in that law that even that information would be revealed to the public over a seven year period of time. Okay. Now what, what happened therefore, and the reason that you've kind of bifurcated, let's talk about the Senate first and then the house is because right. the Senate, the Senate passed that 64 page law, uh, full details, you know, advocating the, the disclosure of all this information. What happened is it went over onto the house side and even though, 99% of all the members of the House of Representatives, uh, Democrat and Republican alike, uh, wanted to get that 64-page bill approved. It turns out that the chairman of the uh, House Intelligence Committee, uh, Michael Turner, uh, who not coincidentally turned out to be the, uh, the congressman from the 10th Congressional District in Ohio, which is the home base uh, of the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which is the place to which the craft was taken from Roswell uh, when it crashed back in July of 1947. It is the place where we know that some of the debris was stored, where the bodies were taken. Uh, and we also know, very importantly, that it's one of the principal field offices of one of the major private aerospace industry uh, members, uh, a, uh, a, a group called Radiant Technologies. Uh, Radiance Technologies is engaged in this process of trying to back engineer uh, the technology of the UFO craft uh, to transform them into a new weapon system for the United States government. Uh, and so he, he, uh, despite the fact that 98% of all the members in the House wanted this 64 page bill passed, he stuck his thumb right in the eye of everybody. Uh, and was tried to sit down on it and prohibit it from being passed. Uh, and he recruited uh, the, the Republican congressman uh, who is the chair of the House Armed Services Committee, uh, a, a man by the name of Michael Roger. And it turns out that he is from the second congressional district in Alabama, which is the home base uh, of the uh, major uh, rocket Redstone rocket range, <laughs> where they're attempting to integrate the UFO technology into a propulsion system for a, a nuclear rocket system that can deliver a first strike weapon into Russia or China inside of two minutes. Uh, and so he also got on board and, and tried to keep this information from being revealed because they were both on the payroll, basically, of the private aerospace industry that is trying to back engineer this for private personal profit so that they can get a patent on this technology. Now, when, when those two people uh, were resisting this, uh, they went and recruited the new, the new fellow who has been put in charge of the House of Representatives, the new House Speaker, uh, the fellow there whose name is Michael Johnson. Uh, and he joined with them uh, to try to block this bill. Uh, at first, they tried to take out uh, the, uh, the the right of subpoena power that was going to be given to this this board, uh, and then they also objected to the assertion of the right of eminent domain. Uh, very importantly, to take back into the possession of the United States government whatever UFO crafts had actually been placed in the custody of one or more of these private aerospace industry members to try to back engineer the technology that this law from the Senate side had actually mandated the exercise of, of, of eminent domain to take possession of that, to take it out of private hands and put it back into the possession of the government. Uh, and so that the that major resistance was going on. First, they objected to the eminent domain and our response to that and people working on the Hill in favor of the bill said, why are you objecting to the eminent domain if you don't have anything? If you don't have any of this technology, why are you objecting so strenuously to having to turn it back over? Uh, and then they said, well, it was just a general opposition to the, uh, the United States government exercising power to commandeer private property. Our argument was that it wasn't private property. It was government property that had recovered this, you know, with millions of dollars of uh, taxpayers' money to recover these, this craft. Uh, and now they were trying to take it. Uh, and so that they said, Oh well, if you're gonna if you're gonna leave the eminent domain power in, we're gonna then scuttle the entire bill. Uh, and so that what we did is then mobilized through the the New Paradigm Institute, uh, 
uh, and others, we mobilized the citizens of the country to come pouring forward. Uh, and we had tens of thousands of people uh, that we reached out to and mobilized them through the internet and through shows like yours to, to say, look, at the time is now for the citizens to rise up and say enough is enough. You know, you've kept this secret from us for 75 years. You've lied to the Congress of the United States. You've lied to presidents of the United States. We now know you've got this because there's been direct testimony now in open congressional hearings uh, admitting that they've got it. Uh, and now you need to tell us about this. Uh, and so what happened is that the we, we succeeded in pushing through 24 pages out of the 64 pages. We got passed by the House. Uh, and so that bill still retains some of some of the, some important features. Uh, it knocked out the independent board uh, that was going to undertake this, uh, and it knocked out the specific subpoena power to such a board. But what it did do is it, on the face of it, commanded all six of our United States military services, all uh, 18 of our United States intelligence agencies, all 32 of our United States Defense Department agencies, and very importantly, every single one of the private aerospace corporations that had any information about the UFOs uh, or the ET uh, people that are associated with them, that they were commanded to turn this over to the National Archives. Uh, and so that is an extraordinarily important thing because they've been given 300 days from the passage of that act on December 22nd of 2023, all the way up to October 17th of this year, uh, within which to assemble all the information that they have and to put it into a coherent digitized uh, file system uh, with an index that is easily recoverable and to turn it over to the National Archives. Now, that clock is running right now. Uh, and on February 23rd, uh, the archives, the National Archives is commanded by the statute who have prepared a reception for all that information. They've set up a filing system to receive it, to put it on file, uh, and they're going to set up a classified portion of the information and a non-classified portion of the information. Uh, and with regard to the, the extraordinarily important provision that every piece of information that is 25 years old or more, by law, has to be turned over to the public. Now, unless the president of the United States himself, which will still be uh, Joe Biden as of October 17th of 2024, that unless he personally orders a particular piece of information to be postponed, every single piece of information that's ever come into the possession of any agency or military service of our American government has to be turned over to the public. This is an extraordinary a step that has been taken now by the United States Congress. Uh, and what we're doing in response to this is we have now, we, we're continuing to meet. We have our office right on Capitol Hill, right next door to the Senate Intelligence Committee, you know, and we've been meeting with them uh, and people over in the House uh, Oversight Committee. We've been having lunch with them at the Dirksen office building. Uh, people have been working on a, an additional statute to put the teeth back into this into this uh, 24 pages, to add in as many of the additional 40 pages as we can get put back in, to set up deadlines, timelines, uh, details of things that they have to comply with, standards that can be applied to restrict what information they can keep classified. You know, this is an extraordinary moment that we've arrived at here historically. And we have the Senate on our side, uh, uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, or excuse me, the Majority Leader of the Senate, uh, Chuck Schumer, uh, has come on board uh, backing the full 64-page bill. He's, he's uh, recruited members of the Republican Party who are actually leading this charge. You know, he's got Marco Rubio from Florida. He's got uh, Mike Rounds from South Dakota. Uh, you know, South Dakota being one of the reddest states in the country, that there's no divide between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party on this issue, uh, which is to say a lot. You know, I mean, the, you know, the, the Republican and Democratic Party haven't been able to agree as to the color of the sky, you know, for the last 10 years. You know, but now we've got an issue that not only do we have the largest constituency probably on any given issue 
uh, in front of our United States government. The massive uh, per, per majority of the people in our country want to have this information. Uh, and Republicans and Democrats alike in both the House and the Senate have supported this. So this is the situation that we're facing. What we have to do is overcome the kind of power uh, of the private aerospace industry uh, that is basically uh, uh, paying money to these two chairmen over in the House of Representatives, uh, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee and the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, uh, both of whom you just check their contributions. They get most of their campaign money from Lockheed Martin. Uh, and from uh, other aerospace uh, people that are trying to get to own this this technology. That's the situation that we're in right now. Uh, we're definitely we've got them against the ropes. You know, we're we're pounding body punches to them. <laughs> these couple guys. You know, and the fact is, we're going to be organizing their own citizens uh, inside the 10th congressional district in Ohio and inside the second congressional district in Alabama because this is not. A blue versus green, a blue versus red issue. Uh, Republicans are just as supportive of finding out about this as the Democrats are. So that we're not we're not restrained from going into those districts just because they're very heavily Republican districts. Because the vast overwhelming majority of the Republican senators and congressmen all want this bill passed. So that's what we're engaged in doing at the New Paradigm Institute. We've set it up in such a way that. People can go to newparadigminstitute.org. They can see it right there at the bottom of the screen and just go in and they punch a button uh, and they, they just put in their, their name and their, uh, their zip code uh, and they're immediately informed as to who their congressman is if they don't know who the person is. They're told about who their senators are. They're given the addresses of, of uh, all of them and they don't even have to address anything. There's a whole automatic letter there that they can read and review and push a button and it'll go right to their representatives. Uh, and, and it's not trying to force them into doing anything that they're trying not to do. What it's doing is it's putting wind under their wings uh, because what they, they all want this bill to be passed and we just have to get through these couple guys over on the House side. So that's the situation that we're in right now. Uh, and it's, it's quite an extraordinary moment. And we just we just had meetings. You know, we, we passed this bill on December 22nd. Everybody then went home for Christmas and for the New Year's. They came back. Everybody thought that all they were going to be doing is fighting about the major budget, you know, between now and January 19th uh, as to whether or not they were going to agree to fund uh, further money for the, the war in the Ukraine or more money to Israel or whether they're going to put how much money to the southern border. Everybody thought that was going to happen. So we mounted an additional major movement on the part of our, of our citizens through the New Paradigm Institute uh, to organize and, <coughs> and ask that new hearings be held. Can we jump uh, uh, just really quickly for everybody that may not uh, understand? Danny, uh, walk us through the significance of the eminent domain uh, part of this. Well, what is eminent domain? I mean, we know it's when the feds want to come in and build a, a new highway and they start taking houses, right? We understand that part of it. How does that apply to uh, ET, craft, and paperwork? All right. Well, in, in this case, for example, uh, if, in fact, a United States satellite uh, were to come down out of orbit and land in somebody's field, <clears throat> their own privately owned field, and the farmer went out and said, oh, good, I've got a satellite and I want to keep it. And uh, I want to take it to a private corporation and sell it to them. And I want to get a patent on whatever the technology is in here. The United States government would say, wrong, you can't do that. You know, that belongs to us and you got to give it back. OK, uh, now <clears throat> they would they would exercise eminent domain over that property even though it's not like a piece of land uh, that they're trying to build a highway through. It's not a, a piece of land where they want to build a, a dam that's going to cover it up with water and they have to take the property. This is basically taking possession of something that the government originally owned. But the, and that's what covers, that's what covers most of this. Now, what, one of the things that they're, they're really uh, upset about is the fact that 
the the aerospace industry has taken the position that when they were when they had the the craft uh, the crafts that had been retrieved put into their possession to exercise their expertise to try to back engineer this what they did is they demanded that in order to keep it secret that they would put it under trade secrets uh, and that this would then be their possession that they would technically own this this uh, vehicle and therefore the government could lie and say that it doesn't own any such property it doesn't in fact have in its possession any ufos uh because they technically put them over into the hands of the private aerospace corporation so what the eminent domain would have to be done here is to take it back to actually take back title uh which they had technically potentially relinquished uh to the corporation that's what that's what this is about uh now they could basically say oh that's like being an indian giver <laughs> what we used to call that when and the kids say oh that you gave it to us uh, and, and allowed us to keep it secret. And uh, we want to get patent rights uh, on the technology. Uh, and the government people, because they were so desperate to keep it secret, had apparently, we don't know for sure, but appear to have potentially given them permission to have possession of this and to take title to this. And so they're going to have to take it back. Uh, and that's that's what the eminent domain is all about. And it's right in the Constitution. Now, and it isn't it though that they don't give them a fair market value for it. You know, they say, okay, look at we're going to take it back. You know, whatever amount of money you put into the technology, whatever it is that you were doing, uh, we'll pay you for that. You know, but you don't get to own the UFO technology. Uh, uh, and so that's that's what that debate is all about right now. And is it? And it did. Eminent domain did survive the twenty-four page. No, no, it did not. Uh, it, uh, it uh, is part of the 40 pages that were taken out, along with the subpoena power, uh, because the, there was no independent board set up. And the, the statute was going to give the power to exercise subpoena power to the board. But the reality is the Senate Intelligence Committee and the House Oversight Committee have the authority to issue subpoenas. <laughs> so they, they can subpoena uh, any of this information they want. Uh, and then so that they can get ideally at least government officials to come uh, up voluntarily. For example, they got Friday, this last Friday, they got the inspector general of the entire United States intelligence uh, community to voluntarily come in to, to answer their questions and to testify uh, and to give them information uh, supportive of, uh, of uh, David Gruce's uh, testimony of July 26th, confirming the fact that we are in fact in possession of an extraterrestrial non-human spacecraft. Uh, and we are in possession of the biological evidence showing that the intelligence, the non-human intelligence behind the crafts are in fact non-human. So he, that, that's now been confirmed. Uh, and that this is this has happened again just this Friday. Uh, so this is hot off the griddle. I mean, here 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 we are on Tuesday uh, Tuesday evening, and it was just before the weekend, just before the long weekend that this happened. Now you're going to be speaking uh, at the Conscious Life Expo in in a few weeks here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be presenting on these subjects, but a lot is happening day to day, just like you just mentioned. Right. Um, so I know that you're going to be up to date at Conscious Life Expo, but people are going to be coming up to you left and right wanting updates. Uh, what do you think you'll have uh, come February 9th? Where do you think we'll be? Well, we'll, we'll have a, a, a much clearer look at what the uh, new statute that the United States Senate is planning to pass uh, to try to reinsert into the 2023 bill uh, additional provisions that are going to accelerate the public revelation of this information. Uh, we'll have a much better idea there as to what has been settled upon uh, by, the, by the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Senate leadership, both Republican and Democrat, uh, as to what it is that they're willing to back up uh, and, and put in front of the House and uh, attempt to leverage that passage 
uh, to get it passed. Uh, you know, Michael Turner, uh, who chairs the House Intelligence Committee, and to get it passed, uh, you know, Michael Rogers, who chairs the House Armed Services Committee, they're going to be mustering their power in their alliances in both political parties to get that new law passed. So we'll see how far they're willing to go. Uh, my information is that they're, they're not willing really to give up any substance of what it is they asked for the first time. Uh, it's just that they're going to make it much clearer. For example, they're willing to say, look, if we're going to take, take the, the uh, craft back out of your hand as a private aerospace industry, we're going to pay you a reasonable amount of money for what you have already undertaken and you've expended uh, on that. We're not going to give you the title. We're not going to let you keep the title to the UFO crap, but we're going to we're going to give you a reasonable payment for that. It isn't as though their lawyers didn't realize that that was part of eminent domain, because in the Constitution of the United States, uh, in the Fifth Amendment uh, of the United States, it says specifically that the United States government has the power of eminent domain, and they can they can take property uh, as long as they pay a reasonable and just uh, price for the property, okay? So that's always been part of eminent domain, uh, but they wanna get that on the face of the statute so that the citizens will understand that this is not just commandeering somebody's property, it's basically a, a forced sale uh, of the property. Uh, and in this particular case, it's a sale back to the United States of property that they originally uh, laid title to. Now, what about, um, and we're going to circle back to this, um, but uh, there was hope that there was going to be, we're not out of January yet, it's still only January 16th, that the Senate was going to have hearing, uh, UFO hearings uh, for three, four, five days uh, with the Senate Intelligence Committee and Marco Rubio. Um, is that still going to happen? What they're, what they're doing right now is the, the, because there is such a, uh, a unified consensus on the Senate side, uh, there's only two senators uh, in the entire 100 senators that we understand are opposing the 64-page bill. One of them is Mitch McConnell. Uh, and that there, there's, another, there's another fellow by the name of Roger Wick, who is one of the senators from the state of Alabama, uh, who has a lot of uh, military uh, people in his district, uh, in that uh, those are the only two senators out of the hundred senators that are not supportive of the of the uh, sixty four page bill. <clears throat> okay, so that they're perfectly ready and prepared to hold hearings. Uh, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to bring along the House of Representatives. They want to get the House side because, as people may know, in order to get a bill passed into law, you have to have both of the houses of Congress approve it. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to, to establish a partnership, a working partnership between the House Intel the, the Senate Intelligence Committee on the one hand and the House Oversight Committee on the other hand. So what they've been doing is the Senate has been basically ushering uh, witnesses that it has, uh, 40 uh, deep inside whistleblowers, that know all about what's going on, or basically in the UFO programs that are going on, and they're ushering them across the street over to the House, side, uh, giving the the House Oversight Committee the the kind of uh, goodwill uh, of bringing this forward, and that way is starting to build more and more support in the House of Representatives uh, against the two guys over there, the three guys over there that are trying to stop the bill. Uh, so that that's what's happening. That uh, that. If in, if, in fact, for any reason, the, the, uh, the head of the Intelligence Committee over on the House side or the head of the Armed Services Committee is able to somehow slow down or stop the hearings over there, <clears throat> then it'll shift back over to the Senate side. And then the Senate can say, OK, look, we're giving you a chance to hold the hearings on this if you want to. But uh, if you're not going to do it with adequate alacrity, we're perfectly capable of doing that. Now, so, so we're in regular discussions with the people inside the Senate staff, uh, and uh, they're willing to do this. Uh, but what they're doing right now is drafting up this additional bill. Uh, they're focusing a lot of their attention on this bill uh, in that they're getting the, the full consensus of everybody in the Senate 
except for these two guys, you know, ex except for McConnell and, and this fellow Wicker from Alabama. <clears throat> and they're going to try to get like 98 votes for this this uh, statute. Uh, and then they're going to take that's what the Senate is going to be doing. They're trying to push through this statute uh, and they're at the present time, allowing the House Oversight Committee to actually conduct the hearings uh, that are going on. It's a partnership that's really going on right now. Now, what would the difference be? Because I always think of uh, those famous scenes from The Godfather, right? The Senate hearings and and uh, and Howard Hughes and, and Watergate, for example. How would the Senate hearings differ from what we've seen go on in the House? What's the, the difference in approach? Not really, not really anything. Uh, the, the, the way that the House and Senate uh, hold their hearings, uh, the, they have either closed door hearings where just the members of the Senate or House get to participate in the hearings and they're closed door hearings. And uh, nobody is supposed to be basically talking about what's happening in those, those uh, hearings. And they're preparing public hearings. Uh, and when they, when they come before the, the, the country on national television, C-SPAN, and others that are that are uh, uh, airing these programs, virtually everything is choreographed. That everybody knows ahead of time what the witnesses are going to say. They've submitted their written their testimony. Uh, everybody choreographs that, and then they all ask a certain set of questions. Uh, and and that's how the, that's how the hearing process usually goes on in the in the House and Senate both. Now, what we're ultimately going to be driving for here uh, is a committee like the joint select committee of the House and Senate together, like the church committee, like uh, under Senator Frank Church, that when in fact it was discovered that four of the burglars in the Watergate Hotel uh, that were in the Democratic National Committee headquarters were all employees of the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, once, the, once the smoke cleared on the Watergate uh, hearings themselves and uh, President Nixon resigned, <clears throat> immediately the House and Senate together joined together to convene special select committee hearings uh, with both the House and the Senate members participating to uh, to try to uh, go after some of the most egregious abuses of the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, that was the so-called church committee. Uh, and people from the newer generations might think it has something to do with the churches, but it didn't. It was Frank Church of Idaho was the chairman of that. Uh, no, but it turns out that uh, not a awful lot happened uh, at that. But but what did happen is eventually the House and the Senate set up intelligence committees that we're talking about now. Uh, but they didn't have intelligence committees before that. Uh, so what they did is they set up they set up a House and Senate a Select Committee on Intelligence that are supposed to be overseeing the activities of the of the Central Intelligence Agency in the other 17 uh, intelligence agencies of the United States government. Uh, so, so that's what's hopefully going to happen eventually. Once the, once the critical mass of public support is, is mobilized here, uh, what we're hoping to have is a joint House and Senate select committee sit down and say, this is an extraordinary moment. <clears throat> we're all now fully going to be telling the American people that we're in possession of a non-human extraterrestrial spacecraft uh, and that, that this is a non-human intelligence that's behind this. Uh, and we're going to share this information with the American public. And we're hoping that that will be done through a special joint committee of the House and Senate together. So what's happening now is they're, they're kind of informally dividing up responsibilities uh, the Senate side drafting the next uh, iteration of legislation uh, and the House side calling the actual hearings uh, that are going on to be sustaining of the of the legislation. That's what's happening right now. What I want, Danny, this is what I want. I want the whistleblowers and the witnesses, the UFO witnesses to be lawyered up. I want that scene. I want the lawyer next to him. I want Rubio to go, okay, where are the flying saucers? And then the witness covers up his microphone, whispers to his, you know, and his attorney's in his ear, and then Lockheed. You know, that's what I, you know, that's, I, that, that's the hearing I'm talking about. 
I loved what happened with Grush, David Grush. That was amazing. But, but I want I, you, you know what I'm talking about. I want I want that. I want that intensity. Well, that, that's uh, the, what, what happens in Washington D.C. is they try to get things done uh, in a way that is less spectacular and less public. Uh, they they want to be getting an agreement between the political parties. They're trying to get an agreement between the executive branch and the legislative branch. You know that uh, they want the the executive branch to come in willingly and supply this information to them. If they refuse to do it, then they're going to subpoena them, and they're going to try to get the judicial branch to come in to review the subpoenas, to order the executive branch to come forward. What we're trying to they're trying to do is they're trying to establish a as collegial a process as possible here. Uh, but the people are not going to stand for being put off much longer. That's what's happening here. Our job as the New Paradigm Institute is to do two things. One is to educate the American people so that the American people, uh, and it's not being patronizing because the fact of the matter is 99% of all the people don't have time to pay a lot of attention to these kind of things. You know, they're, they're, they've got their jobs, they've got their kids, they've got their bills to pay, you know, uh, they've got their job to do. And, and frankly, you know, they've got their football teams to support. <laughs> they've, got, they've got their other things that they're, they're doing. Uh, and so what we're doing at the New Paradigm Institute is we're doing the work for them of gathering all this information together in cooperation with every other UFO community group that we can, can muster here to bring all of this information together. And what we're going to be doing is providing courses, uh, internet courses that are going to be available for people in extraterrestrial studies, actual college credit courses. Uh, people can take an undergraduate degree for and get a degree uh, with full credit for, by the accrediting uh, university accrediting uh, authorities to get a, a full a degree as an undergraduate in extraterrestrial studies. Uh, they have a, a BA and a, a Bachelor of Science degree. Uh, they're they're going to have graduate school master's degrees uh, in, in the various portions of this thing, uh, because we're going to have to come to grips with the philosophical implications of recognizing finally that we're not the only sentient and intelligent species in the entire universe. We have to come to grips with the reality that there are almost certainly civilizations that are not only highly intelligent and highly technologically developed, but that in fact have existed for as many as four or five billion years longer than our human species, and that they've had much longer period of time not only to evolve, but to actually explore the profound philosophical and theological questions that have to do with the place of sentient life and consciousness in the universe. Uh, and so these are profound issues that affect the academy, the universities uh, that affect the economic structures of our of our planet, uh, the geopolitical relationships that the nation states have with one another, uh, you know, the, the disparity between the rich and the poor on our planet that is viewed to be so unjust, you know, the fact that, that the basic source of uh, energy generation that we have on our planet uh, is contaminating our planet, uh, you know, the fact that we have developed We've reached into the heart of matter and drawn out the power of, of nuclear energy and transformed it into weapons to destroy our whole human civilization. You know, th these are these are things that we're hoping we're going to be able to overcome uh, uh, all as part and parcel of coming to realize that the secrets that have been concealed, not only by the government pertaining to the UFO phenomenon, in the existence of an extraterrestrial civilization, but also the secrets that have been held by the churches uh, in the synagogues and the temples in which they've known that our human family is capable of extraordinary things, uh, of telepathic communications, levitation, uh, transmutation of matter. There's all these things that these, these uh, prophets have demonstrated uh, in the past among our human family uh, that, that our human family is capable of. Uh, that these are things that make us much more like the extraterrestrial beings that we're encountering, uh, who have evolved so many um, hundreds of thousands of years more than we have. But mm -hmm. there, there's a direct relationship between us uh, and this extraterrestrial civilization. You know, so this is these are things that that need to be uh, carefully uh, studied. Uh, they need to be discussed. People need to be educated as to what the details are of all of this. 
Uh, and we believe that they need to get regular college university credit for this because a lot of people don't have time to do this unless they're going to be getting some kind of a college degree uh, that is recognized by all the other universities. So the New Paradigm Institute is going to be educating people in detail about this and mobilizing the people to take action to make sure that our government institutions respond uh, and, and cough up the information that they have about this information, and very importantly, are going to be willing to sign a treaty in which they agree with all other nations of our planet that no one is going to be allowed to use this technology for weapons. You know, here, 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 here. But, but here's the situation, though. It's one thing to hear from whistleblowers and witnesses and engineers and, and, and to have them come forward. But what about like, uh, you know, uh, uh, James Taslet, the, the, the CEO of Lockheed, Lockheed Martin, the skunk works. Shouldn't he be called to testify? And, and others like him, it, it could go on, you know, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, uh, Boeing, General Electric. It, it, the list is long. Yeah. Um, well, but whoever David Grush has got on that list. Well, that's uh, that what's happening first is that this information is first being put together to be given to Congress so that they know to begin with what the answers to those questions are. Who are the people that possess this technology right now? What do we know about the extraterrestrial species that appears to be behind them? Why is it that they, in the, they, they manifest in some ways that cause people to think that they are maybe extra dimensional uh, uh, as distinct from just extraterrestrial? And, and what is it that causes pe some people to suspect that they are extra temporal, that they appear to potentially even be human species that's come back from the future to try to confront us about risks that we're engaged in right now? Now, there are, all these questions need to be answered. And the Congress wants to get the answers to these so they know how to roll this out to the public in a way that is going to be able to be integrated into our major institutions. That, that's what's going on. The fact of the matter is that they're going way too slowly. They're going way too slowly. The, the people in the United States and across the world are, are fed up with this now that there are tens of thousands of people who are seeing these craft all over the place. Uh, they're having direct encounters with the occupants of, the, of these of these craft. And so they aren't going to be able to keep this secret much longer. And so what the proponents of a controlled disclosure plan are, are proposing is that this be done in a rational, systematic, choreographed manner to get this information out to everybody so we can at the same time start to amend our institutions and integrate these into our academic areas of discipline, et cetera, so that this is a soft landing. Uh, that's, that's what's happening. Now, what's happening is if, they, if the aerospace industry and the national security state people refuse to participate in that uh, and keep on saying, oh, you know, we, we, we can't allow controlled disclosure, then what's, ha what's being threatened here is what they keep referring to as, quote, catastrophic disclosure. That, uh, that this information is going to come pouring out all of a sudden uh, and it's going to overwhelm everybody. Uh, and if they don't act responsibly about this and choreograph the rolling out of this in, in a systematic and effective way, people can become dislocated uh, and become uh, you know disoriented about this. They can begin to suspect that somehow we've lost our place not only uh, in the geophysical center of the universe, which we sort of got settled, it with Copernicus and Galileo back in the 15th century. But lo and behold, we're not even any longer at the apex of the pyramid of sentient life in the universe, uh, is that we're, we're somewhere down the totem pole that, that, and the, that people are afraid that if we're not number one, uh, then we may lose all sense of our own self-value. This, this, this can't be allowed to happen. Uh, we, we need to be able to maintain our, our understanding of our importance in the universe, but we have to have an accurate understanding of where we actually fit in uh, and come to own that and come to embrace that uh, and, and become team players uh, with the people in the universe. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a complex operation uh, in that we at the New Paradigm Institute are at one and the same time going to be pressing to get as much of the information out as rapidly as can be done. At the same time, we are working at trying to design a new paradigm 
worldview uh, that can actually integrate this much larger reality into the spectrum of our present human worldview. Uh, every single one of the present worldviews on the spectrum of worldviews that range everywhere from authoritarian to reactionary to conservative to moderate to liberal to progressive to utopian, which people recognize these kind of different worldviews, all of them share the common feature that they all believe that we are the only sentient, intelligent life in un the universe. <laughs> yeah, you're right, though. You're, you're right. You know that scene um, in Deliverance, the kid with the banjo on the front porch? Yeah. That's, that's the way the universe looks at planet Earth. <laughs> well, no, I, that's not a joke. <laughs> that's not just it's, reality. It, it, it's interesting. I mean, it is. The, we, 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 I, th I think in terms of, you know, eventually having to, uh, hypothetically, I mean, to stand in front of some sort of a galactic federation and, and represent our planet. Uh, you know, I have to keep thinking of modeling this in some way that is, is functional. You know, how do I defend the fact that we have, that, that, that we, we have people over in the Ukraine, you know, wading around tonight, uh, you know, up to their knees in, in filthy water in trenches, you know, rat infested, shooting rockets at each other, arguing over the boundary line along the piece of land around there. You know, or, or that we've got, you know, the, the state of Israel carpet bombing, you know, civilians uh, in the Gaza, you know, of, of killing, you know, literally tens of thousands of, of women and children non-combatants, uh, you know, in, in response to them having had, you know, uh, you know, 1,200, almost 1,400 people slaughtered, you know, brutally, you know, that, that we, we've got a ways to go here. We've got a ways to go. And the, the, the people that are surrounding our planet in, the, in our, our galaxy are saying, look, uh, it's not at all clear that you people are welcome to come out here into the rest of the civilization at the present time, uh, you've got some growing up to do here. Uh, and so what we're, we're, what we're trying to do is have a uh, sort of middle school classes <laughs> for, for kids that are coming, coming out of, you know, the grade school, uh, getting ready to go into high school. Uh, and, and we're certainly not at the college level yet of our, of our right. galaxy, but we're, but what we're trying to do is we have a, a preparatory school here. A prep school, uh, a UFO or ET prep school at the New Paradigm Institute uh, of trying to get people to, to brush up on their math, br brush up on their reading skills, you know, uh, br brush up on their knowledge <clears throat> about what is already known about the UFO people. Uh, there's a whole lot already known uh, over the past 75 years, not because the government has admitted it, but because regular trusted citizens have been telling people about this, you know, for 75 years. We, you and I have been to a hundred different conferences where extraordinarily credible and expert people come up in front of us and lay out the details, you know, and, and explain it all in details. They show charts and graphs and uh, scientific evidence to support these things. So that's another thing the New Paradigm Institute is going to be doing is sharing with our people what we already know. So, so that we have a number of tasks at the New Paradigm Institute, and we're asking people just to go to newparadigminstitute.org. You know, it's all free. Just come in there, punch the button, put in put in your name and your your zip code. Uh, you'll get your congressional staff member, or congressional people, senators, and a letter will be sent to them uh, showing your support for their passing the entire bill and getting it operational. And you'll also be getting regular. We have almost daily. Uh, publications now coming out. We've just put in a whole new uh, computer system uh, in our in, in the New Paradigm Institute that is able to respond to people's questions to get information back out to them. We're going to be setting up 435 action teams, one in each congressional district, where people can convene and have these conversations and tune in to getting courses provided to them from the New Paradigm Institute. Uh, we're going to be convening a gathering of, of uh, a lot of the people in Washington, D.C. on February 23rd, uh, which is the day that the uh, that the National Archives has been given to have set up the the whole uh, system for receiving this information. So we're, we're calling people into town. We're going to be preparing for that. We're going to go meet with the people over at the National Archives uh, to let them know that uh, we're all ready. You know, so when they get ready to start making this 
public. We're here to help them, uh, to help digest this information, package the information, get it out to people in a comprehensible way. Uh, so this, I mean, this is a, an extraordinarily exciting time uh, for us. You know, I, I've been at this for 50 years, well, 47 years, I guess. Uh, and, uh, and now the time has come when we're, we're doing what it is we've all been planning to do together, Jimmy, for, for all the decades that you and I have known each other. So, um, I, I, Bill and John aside, if you could uh, get the links up for Danny in the chat for everybody so they can head over to Romero and, and contact their elected officials. All you need is your name and your zip code. And, uh, and, and you can just uh, click away and get that stuff done. It's very important. Um, we're going to uh, take a break here, Danny. But when we come back, I'm going to – this is called the setup. So I'm going to set up for when we come back after the break. Um, the press release came out uh, about two weeks ago that there was going to be a classified briefing – being held, um, and the IG was going to chair that briefing uh, with with the House, uh, with Congress. Uh, what's the update on that? Okay. That, that happened on Friday. That happened on Friday, uh, and uh, t Tom came in uh, and, uh, and was questioned by the, the, the people, the staff people, but the only people that were allowed in that hearing were the members, there are 48 members of the House Oversight Committee. Uh, and there were 16 of them there uh, at that hearing that had the adequate clearances. Uh, and the, what they were, they were inquiring of the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community to, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, Tom, Tom uh, Mannheim is the, the fellow who's the new IG. Uh, and he was required to provide to them information as to the credibility of what it was that uh, that uh, Colonel Grosch had testified to back in July, uh, the 26th of July. Is it true uh, that we have uh, such a craft? You, as the Inspector General of the entire intelligence community, what have you come to know about the existence of that craft? You know, do we in fact have biological evidence of there being a non-human species that is responsible for the UFO phenomenon? What is it you can tell us uh, here? You know, uh, do you have any idea where they come from? Uh, you know, how forward leaning ha has the inspector general's office become uh, into trying to get this information? You know, that one of the one of the challenges is that the arrow office that has been set up uh, by the legislation that was passed in 2022 is is willing to have a door open so that whistleblowers can come in and give information to them. But the problem is twofold. One is that the whistleblowers don't trust them <laughs> to do anything with it, uh, and, and secondly, that they're they're not they're not going out trying to find information. Uh, they're not really trying to get information. Uh, they're just being willing if someone insists upon talking about it that they've got a place to come to. Uh, and so that was one of the that's the impetus for the new statute that was passed in 2023 actually to set up a, a, an independent board with subpoena power in the, the power of eminent domain to go get the information, okay? Uh, and we're, we're, we're partway there now because the order has been given. The order has been issued uh, for them to turn this all over. Uh, the problem is that that was exactly what they did back in 1984 in the Boland Amendment when the Congress passed the, the resolution ordering the executive branch to not give military equipment to the Contras, either directly or indirectly. And what happened is because there was no enforcement mechanism in the Boland Amendment back in 1984, the CIA and the covert operations people just started going around them and started you know, smuggling the weapons in, trying to pretend that it was all being done by private organizations. And so we at the Romero Institute had to go forward and file a major federal criminal racketeering charge uh, against them uh, for their drug smuggling and their assassination programs and all of the criminal activities, the violation of the import uh, laws, uh, you know. And so we did that in forced major public hearings in the Iran-Contra hearings. And, and it resulted in the, the indictment, the criminal indictment of six of the top level people in the government. So so that's that's what we're in. The, we're trying to avoid that process here. We're trying to get 
uh, the Congress to cooperate with this right from the very beginning so that the citizens don't have to do this all alone. I mean, that's why we've hired these other people. You know, we've hired these lawyers, 86% of them in Congress are lawyers. We've hired them as our, our legal counsel to do this for us, to exercise the constitutional authority and responsibility that they have uh, to get this information and to cull the information and decide what laws need to be passed to start adjusting our entire culture, our entire economy uh, to integrate the reality of this much larger uh, community that we're part of. Uh, that that's what the institute is doing, and that that was what those hearings are the beginning of uh, this just this past Friday. It's incredible, and uh, I wanted to ask you this. I know that I've joked about this over the years with you, Danny, but it it needs to be said. You've done so much in your life, and and have accomplished so much. But right now, this moment is about as crazy as it's ever been, not only for you, but for the rest of the world. Okay. What is the what? How is this being discussed in, in the House on Capitol Hill? Are they really using like flying saucers and UFOs and ET and UAPs and sentences? Yes. You know, the, the, there, there are, are full scale conversations going on. Between between people like Matt Gates and Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, that are both uh, members of the House Oversight Committee, they're actually sitting in meetings together, having cordial conversations uh, about UFOs and about extraterrestrial intelligence. You know about whether or not uh, these beings are extra dimensional. You know, uh, and what is the what are the economic uh, consequences of this? Of discovering that we're that there's this technology that exists, you know that they've done an estimate now that the the Tic Tac, for example, that was was publicly revealed to the world on December seventeenth of two thousand seventeen, you know that that was apparently generating something like eleven thousand uh, megawatts uh, of power, uh, and uh, and here we are, you know, burning coal you know, and, and pumping a schmuck up into our atmosphere, you know, and killing our, our climate system. And, and the national security state people are concealing this energy source because they're trying to figure out how to propel a rocket to go to Russia and blow it up uh, in two minutes. You know, uh, it's, you know, the, as I've mentioned, the old Sufi saying that when a pickpocket meets a saint, all he sees are his pockets. Uh, and uh, that that's what's happening. That's what's happening right now. Uh, and so we, we've got to be able to recognize the kind of, if you might say, the divine nature of what it is that's happening here to our human family uh, and not descend into trying to figure out how to pick the pocket uh, of an extraterrestrial civilization, but to be willing to establish a, a camaraderie and a communication system with them uh, and enter into a mutually beneficial, cordial future uh, with with these with these people. Let's take our break right here, Danny. Stay right there. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Stay with us. We'll be right back. My job is not to preach. My job is to take you on this journey. In a state of passion, nothing negative can happen. That it's the moons of those planets that would have life. Sometimes I see, you know, these energies also in your field. It is our passion and our pleasure.
Hi, everybody. Jimmy Church here. Very special announcement, and that is we are shipping Fade to Black t-shirts again. It's been almost two years. We did a full upgrade to the website, so you can head over to jimmychurchradio.com. It's all simple to do, and it's right there. Remember... We broadcast four nights a week, Monday through Thursday. We bring you the best, the brightest, the most knowledgeable and amazing guests, the best conversations. We do that four nights a week. We also do four days a week. We broadcast the news, and we do that live, too, as well. It's not a one-man show. I do it with website support. I do it with producers. I do it with writers and artists. All contribute to the show. The best way to help support what we do here is with the Fade to Black t-shirt. And you can get your Fade to Black t-shirt one of two ways. First... Go to jimmychurchradio.com, order a shirt. It's really that simple. You're going to get a tracking number, it's going to get shipped, and it's going to get autographed. The second way to get a shirt is with a Game Changer membership. Now, the Game Changer membership not only includes a free t-shirt, but you get a private email to me. You get unlimited commercial free downloads. You have full access to the website, and everything includes includes free shipping and everything is autographed. So help support the show. Get your fade to black t-shirt today. The links are below. You can just go to jimmychurchradio.com and it's right on the website. So there you go. I'm Jimmy Church, fade to black. I'm so excited that I just have one thing to say. Go back Lee Tappy. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Danny Sheehan is with us. We're talking about UFOs, ETs, UAPs, contact, reverse engineering of ET craft, and the national security state, and all of the updates that are going on right now in Washington, D.C. And uh, getting back to where we were, Danny, um, there was a lot of frustration from some of those elected officials uh, as they came out of uh, the skiff and saying that they didn't get what they were looking for. They weren't getting the answers. Um, did you hear those same echoes of, of frustration? Well, the, the reality is, is that they, the, the, they start, they started at the, at the kind of the bottom of asking the inspector general as the institutional officer that is responsible for overseeing the propriety of the conduct of the 18 intelligence agencies of the United States government. Now you kind of, you kind of ask yourself as a lawyer, I wonder what second prize is, <clears throat> you know, being in charge of the moral oversight of our intelligence agencies, you know, but the bottom, bottom line is the question was, what did he know? Uh, how much? How much had he exercised his uh, authority to find out about what they're doing? Uh, you know, and he's sort of like the internal affairs guy at the police department. You know, you know, don't ask, don't tell. You know, if you don't ask about what's going on or what kind of police brutality is going on or corruption of you know people on the vice squad stealing money from drug dealers, if you don't ask about it, uh, then you don't have to worry about reporting it. <clears throat> so the question that they were really looking at is trying to find out how effective the inspector general office for the intelligence community really was uh, in getting at this information, trying to figure out how to cure uh, an unconstitutional set of activity on the part of the intelligence agencies 
by concealing this information, lying about the information, and mounting a full-scale covert operation stateside to suppress uh, the citizenry from being able to find out about this or even to tell people about this. Uh, you know, that that was the initial uh, initial opening. The, the, that committee, the oversight committee over at the House side, knows that the Senate Intelligence Committee has 40, you know, uh, deep inside uh, experts about the, uh, the program that's been going on who have come forward and provided under oath sworn testimony with documented backup proof of the veracity of what they're saying uh, coming to the Senate Intelligence Committee. They have avoided going to the uh, to the arrow office, as I mentioned earlier, that they don't trust them. They don't believe that they're engaged in a good faith effort to really ascertain the truth. Uh, they're just sitting there as a placeholder right now. <clears throat> and so the, the bottom line is the Senate Intelligence Committee has these 40 uh, a class A investigative uh, uh, experts uh, who are prepared to testify uh, open in open hearings. Uh, and so what they're doing is there are 12 of them that have been lined up now to kind of shuttle over to the House side. Uh, and so the first the first of the witnesses was the inspector general himself to determine uh, on the part of the committee what he knows and how diligently he's been trying to find out any of these things. You know, I mean, the, 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 the last hearing, the hearing before this that they had, before uh, 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 Colonel Grosh testified, you know, they sent two people over from the, the executive branch. And one of the congressmen, I think it was Gallagher, asked him, well, tell us about the fact that, you know, up in Montana, uh, back in 1969, a UFO appeared over the Minuteman missile site and shut off all 10 of our nuclear missiles. Tell us what you know about that. And the two witnesses had been sent over by the executive branch, kind of looked at each other and said, boy, did you hear about that? I didn't hear about that. I didn't get any memo on that. <laughs> like, like, what are these people doing there? You know, wh why are they the ones that the executive branch is voluntarily offering up to the, to the legislative branch? Uh, it's completely inadequate. And so they started out with the inspector general. Uh, and it was less than, uh, well, let's say it was disappointing. Uh, when they discovered how little he had undertaken to really try to find out about what was going on, what type of unconstitutional activities were being engaged in by the by the intelligence agencies, you know, and so now that they're getting ready to move to the twelve, there's twelve additional witnesses that have been selected out by the Senate Intelligence Committee to proffer over to the House side. They had three of them lined up, uh, but the the questioning went on for for so long of the Inspector General. Uh, because of the disappointing answers that he was providing, uh, that they used up the time uh, for that uh, last Friday. So now there's three, three of the uh, of the 40 witnesses uh, that are now getting ready to be brought forward by, over at the the House side, the Oversight Committee. Uh, and there's another nine of them that are in line to start being kind of uh, ushered in one at a time over to the House side to start putting pressure on the House side since they're the ones that stopped the passage of the full uh, Controlled Disclosure Act. Uh, and so what they're doing is they're rolling these, these people in uh, and they're going to start, uh, they've got all 40 of them that are prepared to testify. Uh, and so that uh, that's being choreographed right now. At the same time, the legislation is being drafted uh, by the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Armed Services Committee over there under Jack Reed. Uh, and they're putting together the statute saying, look, if you don't want to have one whistleblower after another start coming forward and start making public the information that they're revealing, uh, that you'd better pass this bill, that we gave you the opportunity back in December of 2023 to do it, but you didn't take the opportunity then. We're going to give you another chance. Uh, so look, at, here, here's, here's the, the, the new additional part of the bill we're proffering. Here are the different witnesses that we're starting to roll into you. This is a very sophisticated program that's going on right now uh, of choreographing the rolling out of this information. Uh, and so that the, the, the stage that we're in right now is the House Oversight Committee starting to educate themselves and the, the House Intelligence Committee members over there on that side. So they're willing to, to go to the mattresses, basically. Uh, against the, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee and the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee to push them onto an island so that they're there all by themselves 
and all the rest of the people on the House side are going to be willing to come forward and support what the Senate is trying to get to happen. Uh, so that's that's what's going on. That's why they were disappointed uh, in just the testimony of the IG. Now, uh, Thomas Monheim, uh, the Inspector General of the Intelligence commu uh, Community, what's your relationship like with him? Well, I mean, the, the, important, the important thing to remember is that prior to him becoming the Inspector General for the entire intelligence community, he was general counsel to the Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Uh, the, Geo, the Geospatial Intelligence Agency is the place where one of our sources that we talked to from the Central Intelligence Agency that was in the Central Intelligence Agency program doing the surveillance uh, of UFOs, uh, uh, airborne UFOs. Uh, that uh, They said that the, the primary location of the information about the Roswell event is housed over in the geospatial, the geospatial intelligence agency, uh, and this is where this is where Mannheim came from. Uh, and so the understanding was is that he knew things not only in his capacity as the the new inspector general of the intelligence community, but he was in possession of information in his former incarnation as the general counsel uh, over at the geospatial intelligence agency. Uh, and that uh, uh, all I can say is that it appears that the the testimony that he was willing to provide was disappointing. Uh, Did the the information that everybody seems to be complaining about, or the lack of, and the frustration was it was it Monheim that was supplying? Was it Monheim getting questioned by the House, or did they actually have other witnesses in in the skiff? No, that uh, that, that Monheim was the the main witness. They. They, I, as I understand it, there were three of the 12 witnesses that had been prepared, that there were three of them that were prepared to testify over there. Did Grush, was Grush part of that? No. Okay. No. The, 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 what they were doing is they were providing support for the veracity of what it was that Grush had said uh, back in, on July 26th. That was the that was the kind of the framing of the thing. Let's try to find out in, in light of the extraordinary nature of what it is he was saying, uh, and he was saying that he had talked to people who had the firsthand knowledge about this. You know, who do we know that has the firsthand knowledge about this? And this is part of these forty witnesses that have that firsthand knowledge and the documented proof to demonstrate the truthfulness of what what Gross was saying. And so there were three of them that were prepared to testify. Uh, and I, I, based on what I know so far, uh, I don't believe that they had an opportunity to testify. Now, okay, there are a lot of IGs, okay? Every department's got their own IG. There's a lot of, the, yep. the list of IGs is long. When Grush supplied his documentation to his IG, was that Thomas Monheim or was that another? That was, that was Chuck McCullough. Uh, Charles, Charles McCullough was the inspector general for the intelligence community uh, at the time. Uh, David Grush uh, came forward, uh, and uh, and actually the extraordinary facts are that when he reported his information to the inspector general, uh, when it was Chuck McCullough, McCullough investigated it aggressively, determined that what Grush was saying was entirely credible. Uh, and that it was important and needed to be acted upon immediately. And what then happened is, is Charles McCullough retired as the IG and became the lawyer for David Grush. So, uh, so my question, I want everybody to understand here, and you're explaining it well. So that paperwork, that evidence that Grush handed over to McCullough is now in the possession of Thomas Monheim. That's right. And Thomas Monheim is kind of an insider already in the intelligence community yeah. and may or may not handle it the same way that McCullough did. Uh, that's right. That's right. Uh, and so the, the, the question is, you know, how long he's going to remain in that position, you know, uh, unless people trust him. You know, if, if, if people don't trust him, they're not going to be coming forward to the inspector general 
and the institutional structures that are being put together to try to bring this information forward uh, are failing. Uh, and so you're going to get more and more pressure coming from the citizenry to fi either fix it or the uh, people ourselves are going to have to take over here. You know, and, and so that what we're, we're talking about, we're, we're actually going to be training at the New Paradigm Institute people to engage in direct citizen diplomacy with the extraterrestrial people. You know, just like we did with Russia. When I was at Jesuit headquarters, uh, we were involved in facilitating citizens going back and forth to the Soviet Union uh, who were dealing with their peers in different professional levels to try to eliminate the threat of nuclear war between the two, the two countries. Uh, and eventually, my staff person at Jesuit headquarters, you know, ended up meeting with Gorbachev and was instrumental in meeting with Gorbachev in helping to persuade him to step back from the Cold War and to agree to a, a mutual disassembling of uh, some of the warheads. I mean, that's the kind of thing that we've done in the past. Uh, and it's the thing that we're going to be doing here now is we're going to be helping to organize a citizen direct diplomacy a program reaching out to the members of the extraterrestrial civilization, you know, through the CE5 process to have people trained to be able to be professional about this, to do the holotropic breathing exercises to kind of calm themselves so that when they have a direct face-to-face -face encounter with a member of an extraterrestrial species, that their body doesn't freak out, you know, which is what happens. I mean, no matter how much you try to talk to a person, say, hey, this, I'm cool. You know, if I if a flying saucer landed in a field next to me, I'd walk right out there and have a nice conversation with them. You know, but what happens is people find themselves in that situation and their whole body locks up because their their body their body is uh, is terrified. You know, of encountering something that is so completely foreign, uh, alien, I might say, uh, to their experience uh, that their body locks up. Uh, and so the, the we that John Mack and I were doing this. John Mack and I. Uh, after it, we had succeeded in pushing back against Harvard University for, you know, threatening to revoke his tenure for even writing about this, you know, that uh, the, the bottom line is we were just at the point of setting up the new Paradigm Institute uh, back in 1994. Uh, you know, we, we've been at this for quite a while uh, where we could train people to go through the holotropic breathing to even actually be trained directly by uh, by Stanislav Graf, who create who developed the the holotropic breathing. You know, we actually did that with one or more of the people who were regular abductees. Uh, we actually trained Karen, this young woman from New Hampshire, so that the next time that she had an encounter with the, the UFO beings, she realized it was coming on. And so she started doing the holotropic breathing. Uh, and by the time they arrived, you know, she was just perfectly calm and centered. Uh, and, and, and she was very successful in having direct communications with them. Uh, and she reported to us that uh, she actually got to go in their craft voluntarily and go to their planet uh, where she met her daughter, a young hybrid daughter that she had. But that's that's a, a true story that, uh, that we had with John Mack. Now, wh what kind of pressure does this put on the White House? I mean, at what point does the Oval Office have to back up in the administration and say, okay, now it's time to... Uh, now it's time to discuss this. Well, one of the one of the challenges that we have in a democracy uh, is is that almost everything becomes political. You know, uh, you know. I, I was I was talking to well, I, I won't tell. I was, I was talking to one of the candidates the other day, uh, and I was I was proposing you know an actual uh, face to face meeting uh, where they could discuss this issue. Uh, to figure out, you know, what what role, if any, is this going to play in the in the election? Can there be some kind of a an agreement uh, to this so that no one's trying to take political advantage over the other person with regard to something that's as extraordinarily important as this? You know, and and the response immediately was, you know, absolutely not. You know, you know, the, 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 we know perfectly well that the other person would would just try to take advantage of this and uh, and beat us over the head with it. You know, they're they're in such a dialectical uh, relationship with each other, all these different candidates uh, that they don't trust each other. Uh, it's it's a it's a failing of the system right now. Uh, but the so so you got Joe Biden. I mean Joe Biden right now is is uh, uh, losing in the polls. You know by three to four points 
uh, in the polls to Donald Trump. Uh, you got him losing by, I think, 12 to 14 points uh, with the uh, with the, uh, Nikki Haley. You know, uh, and, and so he's not he's not he, everything that he's thinking about is passing through the prism of how he's going to get elected again. Uh, you know, uh, and so that he's always going to be saying, oh, what, is this to my advantage and not to their advantage? Is it disruptive of my other my the rest of my campaign? My whole campaign staff is saying, all you have to do is keep talking about, you know, a Bidenomics and how, how well the inflation is getting under control, how you know, the prices are starting to go down for gasoline. You know that uh, we're getting support for funding for the uh, border. You know it, the 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 things that are up in their face. You know there, there's a story that Hal Putoff <laughs> told told us you know, when we were uh, when we were together with him a, a few weeks ago, uh, and he was he was uh, uh, trying to work during the Clinton administration, Bill Clinton, to try to see you know with with uh, uh, the other people to see if they could get information about the UFO out. Uh, and he was having a conversation with a science advisor uh, of uh, of the Biden of, of the Clinton administration, and uh, and uh, and Hal was asking why why is it what's going on here that we can't get more cooperation in, in getting this information out? Uh, and the science advisor said, "Look, let's step outside where we can have a conversation about this." And they go outside and they're walking along, and uh, and the, uh, so Hal says, "So what's the situation like? How would you describe the problem that we're having getting this out?" And, and the, the uh, science advisor said, let me tell you a story. Uh, there was a story of this uh, older man who was coming home one evening, uh, and he was walking through a field, coming to his house, and he looked down and uh, sees a little light down in the, in the grass in the meadow. Uh, and he looks down, and he's, there's a little frog there. And the little frog is there, and he looks down, and the frog has this little light on top of its head. And he bends down and picks the frog up, and he recognizes that it's a crown little crown on the head of the frog. And the frog look, looks up at him and says, I'm not really a frog. Uh, I'm a beautiful princess. Uh, and some terrible sorcerer has turned me into a frog. And all this necessary is for you to kiss me. And I'll turn back into the beautiful princess. And you and I can be married and have wonderful children and rule the, 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 the realm here together. And the old man looked at her and said, well, actually, at my age, I think I'll settle for having a talking frog. <laughs> okay. So, so that's the story that that's the story that the science advisor told to Hal. And so that that you've got people that have such short-sighted, narrow-minded, uh, immediately self-serving, uh, short-term interests that are that are operational that they're not thinking more strategically, uh, and that they're not even really they 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 haven't they haven't structured a decision-making process that enables them to think truly strategically. And this is, of course, one of the most strategic issues facing our entire human civilization at the present time, uh, which directly faces onto the issue of thermonuclear war uh, and on the issue of massive climate change. They, they know that, that, that a, a substantial uh, percentage of the people who have had direct encounters uh, with the extraterrestrial beings uh, always consistently assert that what they're being told by the beings is, You've got to get rid of thermonuclear weapons. This is really nuts. You guys are all going to kill yourself with this. And you've got to stop polluting your planet. You're polluting your planet with putting all this stuff out into the environment, and you're going to destroy your climate system. Uh, and you need to stop doing this. And so that so that the 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 UFO ET issue uh, abuts on these the whole issue of the survival of our human family. Okay. Uh, and whether we're going to make it into the next era where we're going to actually be able to venture out into the stars, you know, uh, or whether we're going to, in fact, self-annihilate ourselves, you know, uh, through our short-term uh, low consciousness activities that we're engaged in here. Uh, and so I'm, I'm eternally optimistic. You know, I, I first encountered this back in 1977 when I was at the Jesuit National Headquarters. I viewed this as this fantastic opportunity to elevate the consciousness of our human family, uh, of really come to, grip, come to grips with the highest capabilities that our human family is capable of uh, as, a, as an entering uh, process into, into the galactic civilization. I mean, that sounds a little, a little erudite, but, but the fact of the matter is that's what we're dealing with here. You know? And so 
rather than settling for having a talking frog, and that is turning the technology into a weapon system, you know, we have an opportunity in front of us to, to actually rise into a wonderful wedding uh, a relationship here with an extraterrestrial civilization that can be mutually beneficial to all of us. Uh, and that we've, we've got to take charge. Our, the we, we represent the 5% of the people on the entire planet here in the United States who are the only ones who really have the ability to change the policies of our country here and to make them come forward with this information, stop them from trying to develop a nuclear weapon system uh, with, uh, that propels you know, a nuclear warhead into the center of China or Russia here, uh, you know, and, and instead you know, uh, mine the information that is available from the extraterrestrial civilization to be able to provide an energy source that doesn't contaminate our planet uh, and that we can, we can move to the stars. So th that's that's what the issue is here, uh, and we we have to get the statute passed here by Congress, and we need to have people go to the New Paradigm Institute org to get all of this free information. We're going to be digesting it. Uh, uh, we've got uh, Richard Dolan is working in partnership with us. We're going to be teaching courses to people about this. We're going we're putting together. Uh, Richard and I are putting together this list of a hundred facts that you need to know. About the about the UFO phenomenon and the ET phenomenon, so that people can all get together and have a common set of understandings about what it is we already know and what it is we have a right to know further. The I, I like the way you put it: uh, catastrophic disclosure, and and I could see and hear that conversation going on using those words. But how, I, I don't see it that way. And I don't know how long true disclosure would remain in the news cycle these days. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't, I, I, I really don't. I know. Well, it's, it's, that's another part of our job at the New Paradigm Institute is to have it remain in the news cycle as a, a major story so that the information can be coming out in a, in a positive way so that people can adjust to it and integrate it into their lives and start to recognize why this is beneficial to them. You know, I mean, uh, at, at the present time, we still have the problem with, you know, we have one, one of the administrations is offering to, to provide uh, your children with, with free public education for college, you know, uh, and yet people are voting against that. You know, it's, it's directly contrary to their own interests. You know? uh, and so that, that people, people need better assistance in trying to understand even their own best interests uh, sometimes. And so that's part of what the New Paradigm Institute is going to be, is going to be doing. And so I think that, uh, that for example, if in fact we, that we're, we're working with a, with a group uh, down in Los Angeles right now to finally get the story out about the Karen Silkwood case. People had heard about the Karen Silkwood case like almost 50 years ago. They realized that there was this young woman that got killed on the way to meet with a New York Times reporter to turn over secret internal documents in the in the Kermagee nuclear reprocessing facility that was owned by Robert S. Kerr, the, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee in the United States Senate. I mean, it's got everything in it, uh, including the fact that they were smuggling 98 percent pure bomb grade plutonium to Israel. Uh, for purposes of nuclear weapons, and at the same time to Iran, <laughs> at the same at the same time, you know, uh, in the this the, it's it's taken us fifty years to get that story told, uh, because the resistance on the part of the national security state to allowing that kind of information to come forward to the American people, you know, they would they would argue that oh that would have been catastrophic uh, if you revealed that. That, you know, that we were sneaking 98% uh, pure bomb grade plutonium to Israel. Oh, you know, if you do that, you know, it's going to destroy our relationship with Israel. You know, we're going to lose our projection of U.S. military force into the into the Middle Eastern oil fields. We're going to lose control over the Suez Canal. You know, I mean, uh, they, they just go on and on about what they view as a catastrophe, you know. But the it's a, cat, a catastrophe to the people who are trying to establish and maintain full spectrum military dominance over the planet. That's what's going on. Our national security state is engaged in that. Karen Silkwood, see, this is why, uh, and I'm so glad that you brought her up. Um, 
that is why it's difficult for whistleblowers to make decisions about coming forward. Right. Right there, right there. They, I mean, well, you know, we've got Purdue, you got this, we got Gillibrand, and we got this. Yeah, but what about Karen Silkwood? Right. I mean, it's like it's an easy statement to make, and and it's a it's one that's very defensible. No, oh, yes, I know that the that there there has been a full scale covert criminal operation going on through the operations director of the Central Intelligence Agency, that what, what, they, what, what uh, they, they refer to as uh, domestic uh, intelligence activities, you know, to neutralize the effectiveness of our American citizens in uh, helping to formulate policies. Uh, they believe that an elite ought to be able to make the policies uh, on behalf of the United States, uh, foreign policy, domestic policy, economic policy, they don't want the people involved. And if you try to mobilize and organize in a way to actually uh, impose the will of the people on them, that they mount, uh, they mount the same tools against you that they believe they've been authorized to utilize outside of the United States against foreign adversaries. And that's what's happened. Like they, they in fact, are the ones that ousted Senator Frank Church after he chaired the church committee hearings that we talked about earlier. You know, his, his very next election, Millions of dollars uh, mysteriously flowed into the campaign against him in the state of Idaho. Money coming out of the Nugenhan Bank in Australia that had come from the drug smuggling in Southeast Asia that the CIA station chief, uh, Theodore Shackley, was supervising and putting the money in the Nugenhan Bank. And they filtered you know, millions of dollars out of that bank through two South African banks into the United States. And all of a sudden, millions of dollars showed up in the state of Idaho, revealing the fact that Senator Frank Church supported the Equal Rights Amendment for women <laughs> and that he, he supported some moderate gun control legislation. And they destroyed him in his political career. They did, the, they did the same thing to Dick Clark of Iowa, the United States Senator from Iowa, who opposed the CIA covert operations in Africa, pursuant to which they assassinated Patrice Lumumba. You know, uh, they they also they also uh, they also uh, did it to the United States senator from Indiana, Birch Bayh. You know, because he opposed part of the CIA's operations. We need to understand that this this problem that we're facing here in getting the legislation passed to reveal the information about the UFOs is a subset of a larger problem, which is the national security state. The national security state. This was set up as of 1947, December, the National Security Act of 1947. They set up this this national security state, which actually functions as an authoritarian, dictatorial, criminal, covert operation. Is functioning, uh, and it's now turned its its uh, uh, I guess you could say uh, barrel <laughs> uh, against the citizens of the United States to to keep us uh, you know out of out of the policy making role, keeping us from finding out about what's going on in secret. Uh, and so that we have to try to elevate the consciousness of our American people about the functioning of the national security state and to to push back against it and, and try to get at the UFO information, which will raise the consciousness of our American people to the point where we can hopefully start to disassemble the, the kind of unjust, unconstitutional structures of a national security state. Uh, that, well, that's the CIA, the NRO, the NSA, the DIA, and the other uh, 12 agencies, there's more, but the, those are the big ones, uh, yeah. zero accountability. And and here is, and they've been, they're so acclimated, Danny, to running that way. They, they don't answer to anybody. They don't answer to the White House. They don't answer to anybody. And what most people don't know the CIA, when it was first, the whole NSA, when uh, the uh, when the national security state uh, got underway in 1947, they were privately funded. They were scrambling for money to fund the CIA and trying to figure out ways to do it. That was corporate money, man. Well, and that's the crazy part about it, and and and. Uh, eventually, you know, uh, hiding stuff in, in, in different budgets and sorry, my headphone case was tangled up in my chair. Right. Uh, uh, they got so used to, uh, doing things shiftily, 
<laughs> Criminal. Right. Constitutional yeah. Yeah. Man, I'm going to get a knock on my door tonight, man. Let me, let, me, let me tell you something that may get your door kicked in. Uh, not <laughs> that, the, 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 the bottom line is that the, 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 initial, the initial letter that was sent to Truman uh, proposing the creation of a central intelligence agency came from a guy by the name of Robert Lovett. Robert Lovett was a senior partner in Brown Brothers Harriman. Brown That's Brothers right. Harriman was a, a private investment group that was made up of like the 12 or 14 major robber barons from the robber baron era, the Carnegie's and the Rockefellers and the E.H. Uh, e. Harriman uh, and, and all these folks that, folks that owned the steel companies, the railroad companies, the shipping lines, the agriculture, the wheat uh, growing uh, combines. These people all came together uh, and, the, and Robert Lovett, was the guy who was who was who wrote the letter to the to Truman saying we had to have a private organization that was more ruthless uh, and more insensitive than our than our adversaries, uh, and that we we were going to have to set aside the doctrine of fairness. You know that that fair play uh, could not be considered a, a, a restriction on us if we we're going to vanquish this ultimate adversary. You know, and that is that is where the Central Intelligence Agency came from. And it wasn't just the corporate money that was coming out of Brown Brothers Harriman, the CEO of which, by the way, was George Herbert Walker. <laughs> uh, and the legal counsel for which, by the way, was Alan Dulles, who was the yeah. first billion director of the Central Intelligence Agency. But but the fact is they got their hands on one point two trillion dollars in gold and silver and platinum and 50 gallon drums of diamonds and rubies and sapphires that that uh, the Japan had hidden in the in the Philippine Islands uh, at the end of World War II that uh, the the G2 the US Army G2 a former OSS guy of the name of Edward Lansdale uh, he actually uh, kidnapped the driver of the Japanese commander of the unit that buried all these these treasures in the Philippines and had him tortured uh, and recovered 12 of those of those troughs of, uh, of gold, each one of which was worth $100 billion. And he got, they got 12 of them. They got $1.2 trillion in gold bullion and silver and platinum and jewels. And they, they pulled them out of the Philippines and they put them in the International Credit Bank in Geneva, Switzerland, and issued gold certificates uh, in the covert operations of the Central Intelligence Agency and others we're using those gold certificates to install right-wing fascists that were actually officers in the Third Reich uh, with new names, and they helped smuggle them out of Europe, you know, uh, it, uh, through the rat line into Venezuela and Argentina. These are things that the American people need to know about, not because they ought to run out and jump out of a first-story window, you know, when they find out about this stuff, but what, what we need to do is, is have people become aware of. Uh, th these are the things that that I teach at the University of California, you know, that we give them the documented proof of all of these details and the students that come out of there usually run right off to law school to try to figure out what to do about this, you know? Uh, and, and so what we're trying to do is <clears throat> make that kind of an education available for people in, excuse me, in addition to the specific information about the UFO issue and the ET issue that we need to get people to understand what the national security state has become here in the United States, uh, because we're going to have to participate in disassembling that kind of unjust, unconstitutional power if we're actually going to get this information revealed to the public. That's uh, and that's part of what the pushback is here. Uh, that's what part of the people in the Congress are afraid of, is that if they try to move against them in this case, that their political careers will come to an end just like Frank Church did, and just like Dick Clark did, and just, just like uh, the others that have been targeted. Birch. I can't yeah. believe you brought up Birch Bai. Wow, I haven't heard that yeah. name in years. Okay, okay. so, but I, the question on my mind, and I know everybody thinks the same thing, is Congress, the Senate, let's just say Capitol Hill, yeah. is their version of disclosure the same as our community's version of disclosure. No. Are we asking for the same things? No, no. The 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 uh, the advocates of controlled disclosure on the Hill are the people who are wanting to preserve what they refer to as 
all of the elements of power that are presently in charge in Western civilization. Uh, the banking system, the economic system in general, uh, the kind of cultural uh, institutions, that uh, they want to maintain the present ruling elite uh, in power because they, they trust them. Uh, they think it's working okay for them. You know? uh, and that, that uh, those of us that are in the UFO community are, are much more uh, populist. You know, we're, we're believing that, in fact, there ought to be a much greater share in democracy uh, not only on the part of the decision-making processes of our government, but also in the economic structures of our government. There ought to be a greater sharing uh, of the resources of our planet, and we should not have 10 million people starving to death on the planet every year. You know, we should not have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people dying of diseases every year that we've known the cure for for over 100 years. You know, well, some people, well, some people are worrying about having to get a second yacht somewhere, you know, you go down to the Los Angeles Yacht Harbor, and th there are yachts there that are the size of the Queen Mary, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and you know, the, the people don't don't need that kind of money, but when, when they get trapped into this kind of structure of, of, uh, of perceiving their own sense of self-value as to how much money you can get, uh, you know, then, then the things are distorted, uh, and so what we need to do is, without demonizing them, without saying, you know, they have to go to federal prison for the conduct that they've engaged in. What we're talking about is having a, a more equitable sharing uh, in the decision-making processes and the sharing of the, the re natural resources of the planet in a way that is sustainable uh, for our planet. <clears throat> you know, that there's, there's a, a great deal of improvement that can be made uh, in the institutions and in the policies of, of our country. And we represent a leadership on the planet and we should be exercising it a lot more responsibly. Uh, and so that I think that the UFO issue is one of the issues that is at the forefront of this type of a, what we call it the Jesuit order, conscientization. It's a raising of the consciousness of our people, you know, so that we can in fact be all that we are potentially capable of being, you know? Uh, and that's, that's what this is really all about. And that's why the national security state uh, plays such an important role in suppressing the UFO information. And everybody here should run right out. Uh, you don't even have to run right out anymore. You can just go to your internet and order uh, a copy of Richard Dolan's uh, two-volume set, uh, UFOs in the National Security State. <clears throat> They're the, the deep former top secret documents right there revealing what it is they've been up to, how they've been lying, how they've, they've known in general twining you know, was the head of the United States Air Force writing letters, you know, back in 1949, you know, to Truman, uh, insisting that, you know, this was, uh, that UFOs were real, that they knew that they were these uh, vehicles that were flying around here, and that something needed to be done about this, you know, <clears throat> so we've known this since 1947. On my on my nightstand next to my bed, I I have two books that I'm constantly reading. I, I brought this down uh, the other day. I had to show it to somebody. One is this: Egypt Before the Pharaohs by Michael Hoffman. Okay, this this is this is required stuff. You know what the you know what the other book is on my nightstand? Richard you Dolan. UFO National Security State Volume One, yeah. and and uh, I, I I've told the story before, but you you'll laugh at this. It's about a year ago. I'm reading, and uh, I closed the book, and it was probably midnight Richard's time. It was around nine o'clock here. I closed the book, I picked up my phone, and I called Richard. And I go, dude, what are you doing? He goes, man, it's a little late. I go, yeah, you know, Richard, listen, man, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but UFOs in the National Security State Volume 1, one of the greatest books ever written. He, he goes, man, no, oh, thank you, man. You've never said that to me before. I said, okay, good night. Boom, and I hung up. But I meant it. Oh, that's right. Everybody should have both both books, but... But I called Richard, man. I was in I was in this warm, fuzzy moment. Like this book is, oh, and, and that's it. I constantly pick it up. I constantly just pick it up. Just, just it doesn't matter what page. 
open it up and start reading. And it's yeah. it's this thick too. <laughs> Five hundred and seventy five pages. You know, yeah. and, and and he's and he's writing a third book right now about all of the underwater uh, UFOs. Uh, so called. He's allegedly writing that book. I've been, I've, been, I've, been, I've been talking to him. I've been talking to him daily. You know, as he's, been, he was, for he four years. Of the draft. <laughs> I've been talking to him for four years about that book. Yeah, but it, 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 it'll get done. It'll get done. So what? What's your crystal ball? The way I mean, what's your crystal ball? Is we do this every year, Danny? Every year, you and I have the same conversation. Is this the year? Mm -hmm. Is this what what is 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 twenty twenty four it? Are are we finally we no, arrived? No, that uh, the the uh, the uh, the activities with regard to the election are are so extraordinary uh, this year uh, that that uh, the, almost all of the oxygen, uh, the public oxygen, is going to be siphoned out uh, dealing with uh, with this effort to uh, to to have some kind of a peaceful realistic resolution uh, of this confrontation uh, that is that is in the process of taking place now uh, between this kind of a populist uh, uprising uh, against the elite governing circles uh, uh, represented by a, a kind of a grassroots very angry movement that has even even to the they're so angry that they're even willing to support Donald Trump you know, a, a guy who who is one of the richest, you know, profligates they've ever run into. You know, and they're willing to support him because they're so angry uh, with the ineffectiveness of the of the state uh, under the Democratic administration of Joe Biden and others to really uh, help them, uh, as far as they can tell. Uh, and you know, there's a, a great deal of instability right now uh, in our American body politic. Uh, we we have the we have a Democratic candidate who's no, whose poll numbers are descending daily, uh, who is trapped in a relationship with the state of Israel uh, that keeps them from effectively stopping the state of Israel from making very, very bad judgments uh, about what they're doing right now with regard to the carpet bombing of, of Gaza, for example. Uh, you know, and it's, it's a tragedy because the, 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 the Jewish people are so heroic you know, and what it is they've been trying to do for the last, you know, 78 years uh, to, to establish an independent state uh, there. Uh, and it's a, it's a tragedy of the highest order. Uh, the same problem is, is obtaining in, in the Ukraine right now with, with Russia. You know, I mean, the, the United States, you know, I know personally, because of our direct involvement with Gorbachev at the end of the Cold War, that he had a direct agreement with James Baker III and with George Bush Sr., that if he signed the release of all of the former republics in the Soviet Union, uh, that the United States would not ever support uh, having any of those republics join NATO. Uh, and uh, the, the minute that George Bush Jr. got in there, George W., but more importantly, uh, Vice President Dick Cheney, you know, that he got in and they immediately started, you know, drafting those countries into NATO and putting nuclear missiles uh, all along the, the, the western boundary of the Soviet Union. Uh, and then they started going down into Crimea, and they were actually going to start putting missiles down into Crimea if they took over the full Ukraine. That's the only warm water port that Russia has, uh, <laughs> where all their nuclear submarines come and go. I mean, it was the most insane thing in the world. Uh, but Dick Cheney wouldn't stop, and he just kept doing it, uh, and they forced the hand of Putin to the point where he had to move into Crimea to protect their, their warm water port. Uh, and, and then the, the other administrations kept it up. So the, the reality is, is that, that we have a situation there now in Russia where Russia is, you know, as I say, you know, we've got, we've got incredibly tens of thousands of young men and women from, from Russia and from the Ukraine you know, wallowing knee deep in rat infested water in trenches in the mud in the middle of winter, shooting rockets at each other, you know. Uh, and we've got the, the state of Israel, one of, the, one of the heroic efforts of the human family ever to survive, you know, carpet bombing women and children in Gaza. Uh, so that this is an extremely unstable situation that we see ourselves in right now. And so I don't think, I don't think that the leaders who who are generally afflicted by this short-term 
you know, right at the end of their nose kind of issues that they're having to deal with all the time are, are going to come publicly to full grips with the UFO issue right now. I do believe, however, that the, that the, the popularity of Trump personally is going to start going lower and lower and lower as the, the trials come forward here in the summer and his own closest confidants all the way to William Barr to his, and, and his chief of staff and everybody are going to be testifying against him. And his, his popularity is going to drop to the point where that it will drop even lower than that of Biden. <laughs> and Biden's going to be the nominee for the Democratic Party. Trump is going to be the nominee for the Republican Party. Biden is going to edge him out. Uh, uh, and he'll he'll get not only the popular vote, but he'll get the 270 electoral votes. He will have a second administration. The the numbers of people that are going to be irrationally supporting Trump personally are going to diminish to the point where uh, they're not going to be a really serious public uh, uh, peace threat. You know, uh, and the bottom line is Biden is going to come into the second administration in the entire four year period, uh, right the day after the election. In the first week of November of this year, the day after the election, the 2028 national campaign is going to start. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the Republican Party is going to be temporarily decimated uh, by what happens in the 2024 election because of the collapse of support for Donald Trump. Uh, and the, the, Democratic, uh, the Democratic Party in that administration for the second term of the Biden administration is going to be moving more and more in the progressive direction. Uh, and they're going to be smart and they're going to be much more egalitarian, much more populist, much more sharing and in, in trying to attend to the, the concerns of the people in the rural areas of the country, et cetera. Uh, and it's going to be, the, it's going to be as strange as this sounds, it's going to be the presidential and Senate races and House races in 2028 that are going to determine the exposure of the UFO issue uh, because it's going to become a part of the campaigns because we're going to make it so. Uh, not only just the New Paradigm Institute, but all the citizens groups are going to mobilize and make it an issue. It's going to come to the fore uh, in the second administration of the Biden administration working toward whoever is going to be president in 2028 that they're going to have to step forward and bring out the issue of the UFO issue. Now, people can get upset about that because, oh, that's a five-year delay. But, but the problem is, you know, we've been waiting for 80 years now, uh, 75 years now. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, I believe over the next five-year period, uh, we're going to have a rollout of this information, but it's going to start really in earnest in the second administration of Biden. Uh, that, that's, in my opinion, what's getting ready to happen. Well, I, there could be something that tips the scales that is outside of Washington, D.C. between then and uh, now and then. And that is the James Webb Space Telescope or yeah. something uh, that is observed in, in deep space that will force decisions to be made. I don't think so. No, I, th I think that, uh, in fact, I think the Catholic, the Catholic Church is already on board this thing. The Catholic Church has already issued a major formal statement uh, from, through the Vatican press office saying, in light of the discovery of more and more of these new exoplanets, the time has arrived now much easier than had been previously anticipated in which we're going to be discovering life elsewhere in the universe. And therefore, the time has arrived for the beginning of a major set of important conversations into the profound philosophical and theological questions that are going to be posed to our human family by the discovery of life elsewhere in the universe. Now, that was issued by uh, Father Jose Gabriel Funes, who at the time was the director of the Pontifical Observatory uh, at Castle Gandolfo outside of Rome. Uh, but he issued that statement from the floor of the press office of the Vatican. Uh, now I was I was Jesuit headquarters uh, and I know I know these people. I flew and immediately met with Father uh, uh, Jose Gabriel Funes, and he said to me immediately, he said, "Danny, look, we're not talking about the discovery of just some single cell life form under some frozen sea on some distant moon uh, in a far off galaxy. We're talking about the discovery of another highly intelligent, highly technologically developed, but distinctly non-human species." right here in our Milky Way galaxy, you know, and so that they've got an entire plan in mind of rolling out the issue of extraterrestrial life 
one new exoplanet at a time uh, of discovering first water, which they've now discovered, which they've asserted as being essential to life. You know, the discovery of planets, actually, if you can believe that, other planets outside our solar system. Uh, and then they're going to be discovering that one cell life form. Then they're going to be discovering more complex life forms to the point where they're eventually going to discover, quote, discover the existence of an extraterrestrial, fairly sophisticated culture on some other planet. So they've got a plan in place for trying to roll that out more slowly. Uh, it is true now that the whistleblowers with regard to the fact that there are craft coming and going from our planet <laughs> is, is kind of intervened in that kind of longer term plan that the Vatican had in mind. Uh, and so that, that is now accelerating the process. Uh, but I think that the, 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 fact, the fact that a, a unanimous Senate Intelligence uh, Committee and a virtually unanimous uh, United States Senate passed the 64-page act that set up a seven-year period for the rollout, uh, which they called a UFO, UAP, Controlled Disclosure Campaign Plan. That was the actual terminology of the statute. That's what they've decided to do. They want to have this seven-year rollout, uh, and they're going to prevail on that. You know, no matter how many times individuals like this like this fellow, like, uh, like uh, Michael Turner, uh, and also Michael Rogers, you know, try to stick their thumb in the eye of 98% of the members of Congress. The fact of the matter is the time has come and that overwhelming majority is going to hold, going to hold the, the, the field on this and they're going to roll this information out. And I think that we can accelerate that to a five-year period, uh, even though they think they're going to do it for a seven-year period. The Vatican has got it planned for like a 20-year period, you know, of this planet by planet thing that they're going to be doing. You know, so I, I believe that we can, the citizens can mobilize to roll this plan into place uh, to roll out over a five-year period in which the, the presidential contenders for the 2028 presidential nominations and the Senate uh, candidates and the House candidates are going to have to address this issue. Uh, and they're going to be compelled to sign an agreement in order to get the support of people to say that they're going to support full disclosure of the UFO issue. And that's going to be a major campaign issue in the 2028 campaigns for the Senate and the House and for the presidency. Uh, and we're going to see, we're going to see the UFO uh, rollout of information uh, er, er, during the uh, the campaign for the 2028 uh, Congress and the presidency. That's, that's how this thing is going to happen. So we're at 2024 now. So, you know, as I say, people should not be running and jumping out of uh, first story windows over the fact that there's been a minor delay here. Uh, but that's all this is. They're, they're not going to hold us back now. You know, the time has come, uh, you know, and, and here's Jimmy Church and Danny, you know, having this kind of a conversation, which, you know, even five years ago, uh, it, yeah. it was possible. Yeah, know, so. yeah no, doubt, no doubt. Danny, you are the best, my friend. I love you so much. Thank you. And I'll see you in three weeks. Right here in Los Angeles, Conscious Life Expo once again, and uh, I'll be introducing you. I cannot wait. We've got uh, your, oh, we're doing a disclosure lunch. We're going to do that together, mm -hmm. and you've got your UFO panel. You're also going to do a presentation, so uh, everybody go to Conscious Life Expo. Uh, get your tickets. Come hang out. Danny's easy to find. Yeah. Look for the hair. New, new Paradigm Institute dot org. Get on, get on the internet. Jump in here and get the free information and put the wind under the wings of the Congress people that want to have this happen right now. Uh, we've uh, got the links up in the chat. We've got them below in in the notes, and we've got them over on the website and social media. So go and click everybody. Type in. It's it. Your zip code. And get things going. Danny, thank you so much, man. Safe travels down here to L.A. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. See you in a couple of weeks, Jimmy. Good night, You're everybody. See you, Danny. Danny Sheehan, everybody. And the links are below. Uh, it's very simple. We've also got them up in the chat. Danny Sheehan. And I will see uh, Danny in a couple of weeks at uh, the Conscious Life Expo. It's ConsciousLifeExpo.com. Again, the links for that 
are below two as well. Danny, safe travels down here to L.A. I'll be seeing you soon. All right, and so that wraps up tonight's show. And let me see, what have, what have I got going on tomorrow? Does anybody know what's going on uh, tomorrow night? Tomorrow night, oh, Bill Howard is here. We're going to talk about uh, his TV series, Encounters, The Complete Interviews, and also Season 2. Yeah, we'll be doing all of that tomorrow night with Bill Howard. So, everybody stay posted for that. Thank you, Danny. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you to Jonaside. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek Music, Doug Aldrich, Intro, Space Boy, SpaceboyMusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2024 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. Until tomorrow night with Bill Howard, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.